The silence is broken by somebody crying Trying to be heard, never a word Always the attitude, sort out your own Always alone, wishing for something The world is denying Out in the wilderness somebody's crying Somebody wishing for something to happen Wishing to tell, wishing to help Someone was listening, someone who cared Never despaired Someone to lean on and someone to trust Who needs your assistance and finds your disgust Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. This show is listener supported. Please visit forthewild.world to make a donation. This episode is in collaboration with the Bioneers Conference, which is being held in Marin County on the weekend of October 20th. I'll be hosting a panel Saturday afternoon about emotions and political and social healing. I hope to see you there. Today we will be speaking with Calla Rose Ostrander and John Wick. Calla Rose Ostrander is a strategic advisor, consultant, activist, who works with leaders in California and the Western U.S. to help rebalance the planet's carbon cycle. She worked for 10 years in municipal climate policy for the cities of Aspen and San Francisco, leading climate action and resilience planning and internal sustainability reporting and also worked for Earth Economics, the California Carbon Campaign, and the Rocky Mountain Institute. John Wick is a rancher, carbon farmer, and sustainable land management advocate. He is the co-founder of the Marin Carbon Project, which seeks to enhance carbon sequestration in rangelands, agriculture, and forest soils, and is the co-owner with his wife of Nicasio Native Grass Ranch in Marin, California. On the ranch, John manages molecules, microorganisms, and rain at the watershed scale. John's personal mission is to remove enough CO2 from the atmosphere through photosynthesis to get us below 300 parts per million, or climate drawdown. Well, welcome, both of you. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for Thank having you. us. This it's is, great to be here. Yeah. Very Wonderful. excited. So I just wanted to start off uh, at the foundations of both of your work and wanted to ask if you could explain what about carbon farming excites you? What's the brilliance behind it? And why should the world be getting on board? Well, oh, well, I'd love here. to start off with that. <laughs> <laughs> John, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> we both are very excited about it, as you can tell. <laughs> I think I have a shorter story because John's really been at this for almost 10 years now. I came to it when I was working with the city and county of San Francisco doing their climate action work, I had never seen a group with a solution set like that of the Marin Carbon Project. And when I began to really look at the planet as a whole uh, mechanism, the base of which is the carbon cycle, I suddenly realized that by connecting our material streams, the waste from it, to our soil via compost and then increasing soil carbon sequestration with things we already do, like growing our food and our fiber and the materials that we build with, was really the most compelling solution to climate change that I had seen in my entire tenure um, working in municipal climate planning. So I got really excited about that and decided to uh, leave that space of policy and focus specifically on helping scale up the work of the Marin Carbon Project in California and now across the United States. And I'm glad you did. Um, what, what excites me about the Marin Carbon Project and all of the uh, other projects that have been born out of it, and including the, the really important work that Cala Rose is now doing, taking 
our agricultural approach to rebalancing Earth's climate cycles into the urban sector and connecting with communities and their climate action plans, this, this is exciting to me because Earth is a, a wonderfully complex system of systems. And for our human enterprise, we have a tremendous influence over those systems and their impact on them. And through the last 10 years with the work, I've now got this appreciation and insight that, that that impact can be beneficial as well. And it could be a good thing. And so the idea when we started this work 10 years ago, there was a, a range of options. There's adaptation, there was mitigation, but very few people were talking about solution. And the IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change, fifth assessment, the most recent one, has made it very clear that mitigation will no longer achieve a version of this runaway global temperature. We must remove carbon from the atmosphere in an ongoing way that is sustainable. And that's what the Marine Carbon Project has established. We now understand that managing for carbon, and by managing for carbon in grazed rangeland systems to start with, we've now observed that once you manage for carbon in that system and other systems, you can solve for energy, water, nutrient cycling, and all these other things. So it's the organizing element or the essential element for these natural systems. And when you pay attention to carbon, everything else starts to make sense in terms of water cycling and nutrient cycling and other processes. So when we look at Earth's managed natural systems and human influence, the potential through managing for carbon is to actually balance Earth's carbon cycles. And in doing so, potentially lower the planet's temperature and also beneficially affect the pH of the oceans and stop ocean acidification. So this could scale all the way up to everything we need to achieve. So it's a great inquiry and a great exploration. Well, speaking about scaling up, can you give us a sense of the range of political routes that you could envision for scaling up the Marin Carbon Project's work to a state or national level, and ultimately a global level, that can make a dent in the roughly 410 parts per million of CO2 we have in the atmosphere? Or are political solutions too unlikely, and are community-scale efforts a better bet at this point? Well, that's an interesting question. I'd like to unwrap a little bit. There's politics even at your school board level. Politics are everywhere and permeate human society, and it's how we can all interact with each other and find some kind of agreement. So I think what's very important about Cala Rose's work is that she has a, a very well-informed understanding how local governance, at least up to the scale of San Francisco, for instance, can function. Governance is critically important for human collaboration. And so, you know, I would invite Cala Rose to speak about the political potential of how to engage our local communities and how that would scale. I really think this question about, you know, is it going to be enough and how is it going to work? Is it going to be local? Is it going to be global? Or is it going to be federal? It's both and answer. I think here in California, we've seen great success working with many partners in this space, from nonprofits to uh, ag advisors to agencies, uh, state and federal agencies that support our agricultural producers to scale up this work, and you can see that in the state's new Healthy Soils Initiative, which has launched this year and will be providing $7.5 million to California farmers to implement practices that sequester soil carbon. You know, along those lines, also recognize that organic matter uh, or compost is a very important part of carbon farming, although it is definitely not all of it. Um, things like riparian restoration, cover crops, biodiversity, these are all things that can enhance soil carbon. But the state is also supporting the creation of really what is new earth or the medicine for the planet to heal in the form of compost with a grant project upwards of $80 million for new compost facilities in the state and then another $50 million to dairymen uh, to implement practices that will reduce emissions from their manure and also help produce amendments that can get out on soils and help them sequester more carbon. So I think we're seeing great progress here at the state level. There are also at this point six other states that have taken action to support healthy soils or carbon sequestration in agriculture. 
and the Center for Food Safety has some great information about that if anyone wants to check it out. There are a couple other states, maybe three or four more, that are considering taking action or that have initiatives at the local level that are pushing for state action. So you're seeing some big uptake at the state level. And at the federal level, uh, we have a farm bill that's coming up, and we'll have some great opportunities there to help support this work, hopefully through the alignment of uh, crop insurance programs with healthy soils practices. And then finally, at the global level, I think you're seeing this beautiful connection between the global and the local. So during the Paris Climate Agreement, a four for a thousand was an initiative that was signed by many countries, but not the U.S. And that was an initiative that pledged that countries would increase their soil carbon uh, this four parts per thousand, essentially what they're saying is we're going to use our agricultural systems to sequester soil carbon. And even though the U.S. was not signatory to the four for a thousand initiative, many local communities, including our fiber shed community here in California, are considering voluntarily signing up for that and committing to those types of soil carbon sequestration numbers. And I believe it's over 130 other countries in the world have signed up for that initiative. So um, in reality, we're seeing a lot of movement from the local state up to the federal and and global uh, on this area. And I'm really hopeful that we're going to see a lot more in the coming years. Yes, as do I. Uh, thank you. Well for, said. Yeah, thank you so much for taking us through this uh, matrix of connections. And um, to move on to another topic, evolutionary biologist and climate researcher Guy McPherson published a 90 page meta analysis that connects important dots about climate from scientific literature of the past three or four years. And what he describes in this paper is abrupt climate change that will gain momentum over the next several years as tipping points are reached and feedback loops are triggered. The concept of feedback loops is nothing new, but what's new is that there are 69 distinct feedback loops, many of which scientists have not anticipated as recently as a few years ago, and which have only become clear as they happen. Um, McPherson is an evolutionary biologist and is able to explain how living communities relate to climate, which is tragically lacking from most climate discourse. And it takes some commitment to look beyond the censorship and political pressures that dilute IPCC reports and media coverage. But this essay, which is available at GuyMcPherson.com, is a really great jumping off point. It's fully referenced with hyperlinks, and it cites only mainstream academic literature. But so anyways, here today, I'd like to bring a few of these feedback loops from McPherson's essay into the discussion and see how carbon farming fits into this rapidly unfolding situation. So there's been a lot of focus on CO2, a fair amount on methane, and very little on nitrous oxide. And in fact, climate and atmospheric conditions rely on all three of these greenhouse gases being absorbed or released by terrestrial communities. Human disruptions in the biosphere have altered these mechanisms and have led to increased release and decreased absorption. And this study found that the cumulative warming capacities of concurrent biogenetic methane and nitrous oxide emissions is a factor of about two larger than the cooling effect resulting from the global land carbon dioxide from 2001 to 2002. So to look beyond CO2, can you address the whole trio of greenhouse gases and how animal methane fits in? Oh, easily. Yeah. And I'm glad that you you describe it this way. There's actually a fourth element. That's the water vapor that's in the atmosphere, which is not a driver, but reactive, but it actually has, has a, a very large effect on increasing temperatures as well. And the, um, so let's unwrap this a little bit. I want to back up a couple of clicks though, and, and I really appreciate Guy McPherson's good work. Where I go, rather than mapping and measuring the increasing disaster, which is really true and well, well studied, What's the potential of intentionally creating beneficial feedback loops that fully recognize these fluxes of greenhouse gases and water vapors and start to rebalance these cycles through the increased management of natural 
uh, cycles and systems like grazed rangelands or row crop systems or urban soil systems. And so what we're really talking about is looking at the different forms that carbon takes on Earth as the lever that can solve for the other greenhouse gases and water vapor. That was what the Marine Carbon Project did as an experiment, which is the lever that we can manage that will solve these other problems. Every farm, everything we do is actually carbon farming. Conventional farming is carbon farming. And in conventional systems, our management of carbon is to till it in the soil system, oxidizing it, and releasing it to the atmosphere. And there's what we've discovered is there's another version of that cycle where rather than tilling and disturbing the soil, rather promoting conditions for life in the soil, we can use a feedback loop that's a good one. And what we experimented with was, can we add carbon to soil without tillage? Can we detect it? And what happens if you do? That was the question that we asked in the very beginning of this. To our surprise, once we added carbon and we were just simply looking for a stable form of it, and we found that in compost, once we added compost to the top of soil, what we witnessed and measured for five years was that that addition of compost in this biologically stable molecule, that is what compost is, it excited a state change in the soil system, creating a beneficial positive feedback loop. So the net increase of carbon that was photosynthetically derived from the atmosphere through plant exudates and soil processes was significant and important. It was, it was a, at least a ton of carbon was added to the system net, accounting for all of the methane emissions from the grazing animals, the fuel burned managing all of the resources, the biomass eaten by animals, the normal respiration of soil systems in terms of nitrous oxide emissions, methane emissions, and CO2 emissions. And what we witnessed scientifically was that putting carbon on top of the soil caused more carbon to come into the system on its own for several years. And our computer models at Colorado State University show that that phenomenon will continue for 30 to 100 years from a single act of generously providing compassionately some nice resources for degraded soils. And this, these resources are in the form of, of medicine, which is what compost is. So that single event of applying a single application of compost ignited a state change that resulted in a beneficial feedback loop that solves for the flow of carbon from the atmosphere through plants into the soil. And the more you do of it, the more resources you create to do more of it, which remove more carbon, and it goes on and on from there. This is a good thing. And so rather than conventional tillage and these other approaches to agriculture, what we've created now is an understanding that there are a variety of practices available to ranchers and land managers that remove carbon from the atmosphere while also producing an abundance of healthy food and safe fibers and renewable fuels and interesting flora. So there are seven plus billion people on the planet. We're all busy having meaningful lives, doing good work. Our idea is that that effort, that energy could be done using materials derived from restorative agricultural systems that rebalance the carbon cycle and solve for your methane and nitrous oxide emissions and, and these other things. I'm not delusional. I fully understand how huge the problem is and how these tipping points are rushing past us. And it's scary. The, the thing I'm excited about is how quickly these natural systems responded to a little bit of generosity and a little bit of kindness. And once you were working with the system, or we did, and once we were working with them, the system response was so exciting and demonstrated for me personally on my own ranch that if enough of us do this, that we could actually affect the entire planet. And it is based on positive feedback loops instead of the negative feedback loops that Guy McPherson is describing. I want to offer a short version of that, which is um, when John was talking about our planet being a system of systems, what we're advocating for in this work is really looking at climate change in a new way. And instead of looking at these greenhouse gas emissions, carbon, methane, nitrous oxide as pollutants, we want to look at them as elements 
within this system and how they stack upon each other and therefore how we might begin to manage this large system of systems that is our planet for health and for abundance and for climate stability. And because carbon is a building block of life on this planet, and there are these other elemental cycles sort of follow it. So when you begin to manage for carbon in the ground, what happens is you get more water in the ground, which makes in turn the ground temperature cooler uh, because there's more water for longer. And that creates a smaller microclimate, which might be able to actually then attract more water back to the system. The other wonderful thing that happens is when you get more carbon in the ground and you have water passing through it, it also helps stabilize and transform nitrogen. So you can begin to fix more nitrogen in the soil once you have more carbon and more water in that soil. So this is kind of an example of the way that we look at these things, not as pollutants, but as elements that stack upon each other within our terrestrial and atmospheric and oceanic systems on the planet. It's a complex idea, but it's actually pretty simple. We're just looking at these things as cycles. Uh, in terms of methane specifically, the wonderful thing is when you start to solve for soil carbon upstream, you begin to also address the methane emissions that are bad now, but can actually be helpful in the long run. So for example, instead of sending organics to landfill where they cause a lot of methane, we're talking about getting that organic waste, your food waste, your yard waste out of the landfill and into compost. That compost then enhances soil carbon sequestration and water holding capacity and nutrient retention. Likewise, upstream, uh, with animal waste and human waste, you also can get a creation of methane and these other gases um, like nitrous oxide in the decomposition process. So when you actively and proactively manage for what we call waste right now, and you do it in ways that minimize emissions and maximize the beneficial potential of the organic amendments of the products like compost that come out of that, then you begin to not only enhance your soil carbon, but also upstream reduce these very powerful greenhouse gas emissions like methane. I would also like to add in that methane is a natural occurring essential element. It's where it is and how it got there that's of interest to us right now. But termites produce methane, and the system that, that I myself am working in historically has been the, the grazed rangeland system, and I'm a rancher. And um, what I've come to appreciate is that grass grows in grasslands. Grasslands occur in rangeland systems, which have mostly grassland, but some brush and some forest canopy. And they are the single largest cover type on earth. Now it's very important to appreciate that grass co-evolved with grazing. Grass is different than trees. Trees shed their leaves or deciduous ones do certainly. And grass can't. It actually relies on an herbivory event like grazing. And it doesn't matter to me who eats it. It could be camels or yaks or rabbits or who, whatever, whomever. But it's important to a grass plant that at some point, some removal of biomass occurs. And this causes a whole cascade of benefits for the plant. So grazed rangeland systems on Earth, the single largest cover type on Earth, rely on a grazing event. Animals who graze rangelands emit methane. It's a naturally occurring rebalancing of these cycles. So over-focusing on methane in those systems is not necessarily our best strategy. Could we put our energies into thinking about what thing we can do with which lever, and we've chosen carbon as the lever, that will affect methane and affect nitrous oxide and affect water vapor in the atmosphere. So by finding a, a benefit, a good lever, which is carbon, it solves for these other issues and creates that self-feeding beneficial system that Guy McPherson is looking for. To continue on this track of grazing and animals that are eating these grasses, the extinction of megafauna on land and sea has led to a shortage of mega manure as a result of the planet's composting and nutrient recycling system, which breaks because of it. And very few studies have been done around megafauna manure in ecosystem function. 
And lands did evolve with grazing, like you were saying, bison on the prairie, pronghorn, antelope, elk on the Central Valley of California. And these are deep and evolved relationships. So I'm wondering how closely can we or should we replicate those relationships? Well, we definitely should. And this is a great question. I'd actually like to take it a little bigger and further. The quaternary extinction is a very important event that um, Dr. Dennis Martinez speaks about in terms of the large mammoth and sloth population that were on the American continent that were grazed forest canopies. And it's his suggestion that American forest systems did not have tree canopies that touched and there was space, a lot more space between trees. And so as humans entered the system 60,000 years ago and ate their way down through the larger, slower moving animals to all that was left were the ones that we see today, they changed the biomass system on the entire continent. So here we have now the loss of a huge grazing component that, that managed the tree canopies to start with. So the, the opportunity right now is, are there proxies for those ancient events? And humans are capable of mimicking a lot of the things, at least to get the system rebalanced. And then if we can find an appropriate population of organisms who can perform the same functions, as historically were present during the evolution of this system, that would be interesting. But the challenge is that this is a new world. We're in the Anthropocene. We're in the sixth extinction. So we don't have the organisms present that were present during the evolution of the system. So we are kind of in crash mode right now. We are losing a lot rapidly. And it's a lovely idea that we could reestablish wilderness and all these ancient systems. But right now we've got some basic repair to do to get function happening in all our basic systems and save the planet from uh, overall global extinction. So that's kind of the, the bar that is set. And it would be lovely to have all those animals present that were here over 60,000 years ago that's not readily available. So what can we do as a society now? Well, let's look at the flows of materials under our influence, and most of them are. So when we look at human waste, you know, we have a population in the Los Angeles area of, of almost 11 million people, and most of their waste goes in a pipe. And what happens to that waste is an opportunity. Are there choices we could make? Could we come up with solutions that remove water from the transportation of human waste? And in so remove the conditions that create methane because we won't be supporting methanogenic bacteria. So the, there are a lot of wonderful opportunities to revisit how we do everything. And so for me and, and the work that I get involved with, we try to identify low hanging fruit. What are the largest systems we can have the most impact with, with the simplest changes. So the description of applying compost to soil is exciting because we've measured benefits to that. In your earlier question, you suggested that, that the large megafauna contributed compost to the soil system, but it, actually they had manure, not compost. Compost is actually a very rare thing on earth. It happens in Australia where you have long-legged turkeys managing a biomass pile for incubation. So they, they keep it aerated and managed for temperature. When you have a river expanding its banks and detritus accumulates in, a, in enough of a volume, a minimum of a cubic, cubic yard, and you have the ideal moisture and air, carbon and nitrogen combination, you get thermophilic bacteria. And it's their presence and their consumption of the feedstocks to build their bodies and their populations that results in temperature increases. And so composting in most cases is an intentional human managed operation. And it's really exciting because when we use biological processes like composting, we can create a biologically stable carbon nitrogen molecule that works really well in healthy soil systems or actually creates healthy soil systems. So field deposition of manures from megafauna is wholly different than applying a biologically stable molecule of compost and the difference is in what we're seeing is that's like medicine to the soil system. 
so that we can restore function so that later manure deposition could help maintain and manage that system going forward. But there's some serious repair work that has to be done right now. And I'm looking to grazed rangeland systems as the first place to start conducting that activity. Well, is there a critical point where if enough rangelands are restored with either a combination of wild or domestic ungulates and compost, and the nutrient cycles would be repaired and self-sustain? So is there enough to actually remove enough carbon from the atmosphere to cool the planet and affect the ocean pH and therefore stabilize our whole system? Yes. (laughs) Okay. So I think it also... I think it's important here to point out some science that's still really being worked out. Uh, With warming temperatures and changes in land management, like overgrazing and species composition in more intense droughts, soils across the planet are actually losing carbon now. Um, So you're looking at systems that are going to be and are already losing carbon and will be losing more under higher heat scenarios. Uh, So, For this to work, it's going to take not just some better maintenance, but active repair. And the role of animals and their manure in that is incredibly important. And we are going to have to see some pretty rapid stabilization in the face of climate change. So it may take, you know, five to 10 years, maybe 15 to restore soil carbon in a grazed system in more permanent pools of carbon or more permanent forms in the soil, you can achieve that stabilization from riparian restoration or compost application much more quickly. So the right solutions for each of the systems uh, is important to really point out, understanding that we really have to shift away from thinking this is a, a one thing is going to solve it. It's really solving for carbon in these systems very actively that's going to do it. And it's also important to note that we might have to do more than we did in the past because of how rapidly our climate system is destabilizing and because of the types of heat and drought we are already experiencing and and that are going to be exacerbated in the future. So within the scientific community, there is a lot of conversation around are the soils going to continue to lose carbon and are they going to reach a point where they are just going to lose carbon and not be able to have more carbon in them if it gets too hot. And then what type of management practices could we do in the face of climate change that might both prevent that soil carbon loss and actually enhance carbon sequestration? It's a little bit more technical, but I think it's important to understand that the system that we're operating in looks and behaves a lot differently on a very different time scale than the one that we've been in before. So we're stepping into a system that's trending in a very bad direction, and it's huge. And the challenge is, is the longer we take to organize ourselves, the harder the job will become. But there are so many elements under our influence right now that we could change our behavior around. And so for me, the takeaway from any conversation usually ends up being, what can I do? And my suggestion always is, put it in the green can, And if you don't have a green can available, call your county supervisor or your mayor's office and try and get composting up and running in your community. That's the single actionable item that everyone could participate in right now. And then that beautiful material that comes out of a composting operation currently in California is sold before it's even made. So we have a shortage. We have demand for compost. The opportunity now is to identify what are the other available feedstocks that could be made into compost. And Cal Rose spoke earlier about the landfills and the organic materials going into landfills. And also there's this opportunity of managing the dairy manure in California and, and everywhere else. But so for our work, we're looking at what are the alternative feedstocks that could be added to the composting stream to increase our capacity to heal more and more land. And then there's a bigger question about which land and what management holds the highest potential to start this positive feedback loop for carbon sequestration that's ongoing. And so fortunately for us, we have a a wonderful group of scientists who can help us achieve data measurement from the basic science in these different systems. And there's research happening now across the state of California to secure data from practices like compost application on great rangeland 
in different soil types and different bioclimatic zones. That data can then be fed into different types of models to help us do different scenarios and start looking at which system under what management holds the highest potential to move enough carbon to actually cool the planet and change the pH of the oceans. So fortunately for us, we have scientists who have the capacity to not only collect the data, analyze the data, but then do modeling with the data. Then for us, the ongoing management of the system is a critical thing. And, and what Calero suggested is that there's no single thing. What there is is an ongoing relationship to our natural systems. And this is forever, and it's our life. We are going forward on this planet, living, hopefully in harmony with the managed natural systems that support life in all forms for humans and wilderness and, and everything. So that's our challenge. How do we measure what for what outcomes? What measurement methodology at what spatial and temporal frequency provides what meaningful information for which management decisions and what else is happening? And so for me, as a rancher, in the very beginning of this work, I made some very bad mistakes. I removed grazing from a grazed rangeland system with the expectation that I would create wilderness. And it did not work. There were too many larger elements in motion. And by removing an essential element, the system went into chaos and the resulting weed infestation and brush encroachment were the opposite of what I was hoping to achieve. So that was where I personally became aware that our management or lack of management has a profound impact on these huge watershed scale systems. So in that, we have tremendous opportunity to inform that management, communicate it amongst ourselves, and make decisions going forward about which systems under what management should we put our first energy into to start repairing these systems to fuller function. And John, when I guess you... I would just... Sorry, Kala, please... Well, I would just add to this, to what John's saying, you know, John's approaching this, this problem that we have, which is catastrophic climate change from the perspective of a builder. You know, what do we need to build? Who do we bring in to build it? How do we change the way that we're managing this system in order to make it healthy and functional and abundant? And the way I tend to approach it is looking at the types of tools that we have out there that the Marin Carbon Project, that John Wick, that many others in the space are developing, is how do we relate to each other? So there's also a huge portion of this that's not just about what's the scientific question around what's the best system to manage when and where, but also how, how is it that we can do this from a political perspective, from a social perspective? How do we change the way we relate to each other and the way we reward our relationships to each other such that there is enough for uh, enough energy to go around. And really in, in this space, I don't think that we're gonna get there just by managing for the science of it. We're also really talking about changing the way that we look at the world from, from a view of uh, needing to control things because there's a scarcity of resources towards a view of acting in reciprocity uh, within our relationships with each other, because we understand that if managed in, in that relationship of reciprocity, there is actually more than enough. There's abundance in the system. So I just want to add that our approach is not entirely mechanistic, although it's based on understanding the mechanisms of the planet. It's also related. Yeah, so I want to, let's expand on that idea of abundance. And uh, at least from my experience, our society, basically our social behavior is based on the competition for resources that are depleting. And what we've discovered here is that there's an entirely different version of our relationship to this planet. And if we learn about and appreciate living systems and living system sourced solutions for our material cultural needs, and you can actually determine what those are if you can compost them. So anything that was ever alive can be composted. And if you use that as your standard and live within that so that everything you touch can be infinitely recycled, which is what composting is, and the energy you enjoy comes from as close to the sun as you can get it, I believe we can actually have wonderful lives that enhance the planet. So the more we do of 
carbon management to produce carbohydrates that also sequester soil carbon, the more resources we have to do more of it. Where else can you do something and get more to do more with by doing more? It's a self-feeding, increasing system. So it's solar-driven, photons come into the system, and then life complexes on life. So living things produce more life. So as long as we live within the living biosphere and use wood and fibers and enjoy good foods and, and stay within that realm, the more we do, the more there is to do more with. It's really an exciting idea. And so this is the vision that we have for Earth with soon to be 9 billion people. There is a version of this Earth where with 9 billion people all working and living and participating actively in a harmonious way with the managed natural systems upon which we rely, we will create more and more abundance for more and more to happen. And this benefits all forms of life on the planet. And as we enter the sixth extinction, it's my fear that we actually have less biomass of life on Earth in the last 200 years than we had historically, which I believe has increased over the last 3 billion years. And then starting 200 years ago, we're actually seeing loss of the mass of life on Earth under our influence. That's interesting and important. That suggests to me that we can influence how much life there is on Earth. So let's manage our systems to create the conditions for more life to occur. And out of that, we get diversity and complexity and a variety of interesting things. So that's my philosophy. Manage for more and you get more. Well, it's actually quite ironic and funny because as we were speaking, outside my little cabin window was a huge delivery of compost from Cold Creek Compost up here in Mendocino County. And <laughs> I'm just watching this beautiful, dark, recycled life be spilled out as you both are speaking so eloquently about this um, integrated system. So I just wanted to mention that. And also, John, to go back to what you were mm. saying about your w when you were not managing your rangelands, wanting it to, I think you said, go back to wilderness. I'm just wondering, a clarifying question, were you trying to bring back native species or were you trying to restore a redwood forest again? Or what was your hope and why isn't that a possibility? Okay, so that's a great question. And so not being informed and being very naive, it was my wife and my expectation that nature would do better without us. And it was our assumption that if we just simply backed up, these natural processes would achieve some kind of wilderness. And we didn't know what that would look like, but we thought it would be really interesting. But there are elements present in the system now that weren't there, that weren't present during coevolution of all of the elements that would have been in a natural system. So there's no way there could be balance like we anticipated. It also has become uh, clear to me that grass grows in grasslands, which are part of rangeland systems, which are the default cover type where there's not adequate water to support a forest. So there's no way that a redwood forest is going to occur in an area where there's not adequate water for it. What we have where we're working is mostly grassland. So the species and species composition that we've come to seek are the native deep rooted perennial plants, but there are other non-natives present too. And what I've come to appreciate is that there are these functional roles performed by a variety of organisms. And as long as there are enough elements present representing all the essential functional roles, we achieve a certain threshold of health. Now, you know, idealistically, there would be all native species present in that system, but that's very hard to achieve because of the, the um, loss of so many of them and the presence of these other ones who can find equilibrium in there. So our vision for our ranch currently, and we call it the Nicasio Native Grass Ranch, is to promote the conditions for the native species communities to occur and not be so prescriptive about which ones are present, but just do our best to try and make health in the system and 
kind of celebrate the good things that happen after we put our intention in that direction. And was it historically rangeland? Yes, definitely. Mm. Well, I'm working with carbon sequestration in forests. The drought-induced tree mortality is up around the world, which of course means CO2 releases, Mm -hmm. leading to more drought. And the stress is not only from climate conditions, but also from the pests and diseases that thrive in these conditions. The Amazon is one of the critical examples of this, where drought and deforestation have led to a drying effect that outpaced all predictions. You know, the Amazon released more carbon Mm -hmm. in 2010 than the entire United States, industry, cars, and all. And because of all the tree mortality and slowed growth, the Amazon is no longer a net carbon sink. A 2014 article in the journal Nature suggests that dry lands are surpassing tropical forest as the primary driver of atmospheric CO2. A paper from December 2015 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, quote, in contrast to existing predictions of either stability or catastrophic biomass loss, the Amazon forest's response to a drying regional climate is likely to be an immediate, graded, heterogeneous transition from high biomass forest to transitional dry forest and woody, savanna-like states, end quote. And then in other research, the boreal forest to the north, which makes up 30% of all Earth's forest cover, is also experiencing a tremendous shift. Boreal peat is decomposing at unthinkable rates. An ecology professor at Trent University of Ontario, Dennis Murray, who studies the mysterious disappearance of moose, describes a huge forest ecosystem that is rapidly shrinking, drying, flooding, and otherwise changing. And he says that, quote, boreal forest is breaking apart. The question is, what will replace it? So most of industrial civilization has happened between the tropics and the boreal, in the temperate zones where biomes have largely collapsed already. And the Marin Carbon Project and other restoration efforts are a response to that. So can any of the principles of carbon farming be applied to forest systems that are ailing but still intact to boost their resilience? And is there anything from your experience or research that could help confront the impending state change of the Amazon or the boreal or the montane forest or any threatened forest type for that matter? So th- that's a big question. And the loss of the Amazon forests ranks, I th- I'm, I'm embarrassed, but Project Drawdown has done this list of the 100 top things. And I think loss of the tropical forest systems is number two or three. Um, I know refrigeration is number one, and that's scary and surprising. Um, so yeah, loss of forests under human deforestation is a huge thing. As a direct management approach, forest systems, the the problem I have is that the cycling rate of an annual grassland versus a several hundred year old forest, I believe I can achieve more carbon cycling through annual grasslands than we can achieve through woody biomass accumulation. The problem with the forest systems is they burn and they're subject to beetle kill. We have over 1.1 million standing dead trees in California right now from the beetle kill, and the beetles are native. They're just not experiencing the freeze that kills them every winter or or causes them to go dormant. So as the planet warms, elements that normally had a place in the system are out of whack. For me, the action item is to work in soil carbon because it's stable and not subject to burning. So the issue of forest systems, if we're going to help the forests, I believe the approach is through other systems and to cool the planet, to recreate freezing conditions, to stop the beetle kill and go from there. I I don't think as a management opportunity, I can't see personally, other than responsible forest management, how to increase carbon in the forest system. Does that answer your question? Yes, it's a huge question, and I just wanted to ask both of you your thoughts on 
uh, the state of the forest and this um, carbon solution. And Kala, Rose, please, if you have anything that you'd like to add, I'd love to hear it. You know, as you're reading through all those forests that are dying, it's, it, my heart sinks, of course, because we are really witnessing a massive transition on our planet where a lot of the life and the life forms that we know will not, are not now currently surviving. And I think our forests are really showing us that. So in my personal life, I've done a lot of uh, ceremony or grieving over the transition of the forest because they've kind of gone beyond what we can actively stop at this point, as far as I understand it. Now, that being said, there is so much that you can do in in regenerating forests under active management. When you keep and take care of those mother trees, the trees that are supporting the other trees in the community, the trees that are going to feed nutrients to the young trees, you can, you know, enhance your rehabilitation of the forest. You can enhance your soil carbon sequestration. We will lose the forest in the Southern Sierra as we know it, and there will be another forest that replaces it. But I think in the meantime, we really have to be honest with ourselves about the type of management it's going to take physically to get that wood out of there where we can um, and put it to good use so that it doesn't just burn. Um, and, and the type of work that we can do to actively rehabilitate those systems. Again, the Marin Carbon Project was concentrated in rangeland systems for a lot of the reasons that John just described. So we are less familiar with the forest system. It's an incredible chance to return carbon uh, either to the soil or to our built environment. Otherwise, it's going to go back up in the air when it burns. But I just would say that I think that we're witnessing a grand state transition in our forest systems. And uh, that has to be acknowledged with the proper amount of, in my opinion, grief, that that's what's happening. And then we need to really look to priorities for how to address that and where we can address it and where we can stabilize things as quickly and as rapidly as possible. And grassland systems and marshy systems, wetlands, coastal systems have a very quick response uh, to regeneration. And so early on, when we started working with Dr. Wendy Silver, UC Berkeley biogeochemist, she didn't, her background was tropical forest systems and tropical forest soils, and she was not familiar with grassland systems. It was a new territory for her. And when she looked into it, my memory is that she discovered that grasslands have the potential to hold more carbon than forest soils do. So managing an annual system that cycles carbon rapidly and what we've discovered is sequesters massive quantities of carbon in a stable full is a much more readily available system to manage for carbon and than forests are forests are very important and and i actually looked it up while we were talking it's on the project drawdown list tropical deforestation is number five um, it's after reduced food waste eating a plant-rich diet, and wind turbine energy, and then number one being refrigerants. But the idea that deforestation is something we can address, it's really important, clearly. But where do we focus our energy on soil carbon sequestration? I would suggest it's grasslands because of how quickly we've measured massive quantities entering the system in a stable form. And so... We have to stop the bad behavior just, in I'm forest. I'm going to interrupt John here. I'm just going to interrupt you really quickly because I think it's important for listeners to realize that the Marin Carbon Project was a group of people, including land stewards and landowners like John and Peggy, who came together to say, what can we do in our space to really arrest this issue of climate change? How do we stop and reverse global warming? Uh, and so I just want to offer to the audience that when people hear like, well, grasslands are better than forests at this, that's kind of the wrong conversation to be having. Um, Grasslands have a huge potential for carbon sequestration and for communities like yourself and your neighbors that are living in forest systems, there should be organization around what can we do to support this system? How do we help this system, you know, fight the effects of climate change or how do we actively help transition it and create a new system or a new forest? in this place because it's people coming together who are working on the land who care about the land 
who are managing it that can really come up with the solutions that are going to work within their landscape. And the Marin Carbon Project did an incredible job of engaging very high level science uh, alongside everyday land managers to help answer those questions. And uh, in terms of grasses in grasslands and rangelands, I think about with plants requiring thousands of years to slowly adapt to climate changes, every plant community on earth is potentially threatened by temperature rise, whether it be over the next few years or hundred years. So I'm wondering how resilient are the native or introduced grasses used in the Marin Carbon Project in the face of extreme temperature anomalies? For instance, is there any data that indicates how much temperature rise grasses can survive? Or what can be done to aid their survival, like interplanting drought-resistant shrubs or trees or you know, something like that? I'm actually not interested in that question at all. You are talking about adaptation, and that's a non-starter for me. We can't adapt our way out of this. We have to solve the climate crisis. We have to remove enough carbon through photosynthesis in an ongoing way to lower Earth's atmospheric CO2 levels. So our mission is to figure out ways to shift where the carbon is between carbon pools and cool the planet and avoid this whole idea of having to adapt to a warming planet. I, I'm not, I'm not going to go there with you. I, I'm not worried about adapting to a disaster. It's a disaster. We have to stop and reverse global warming. And that's what's exciting about what we've done. We've shown that you can actually remove carbon from the atmosphere. And once you do, the system itself continues to do it. And the species of grasses that are thriving are the normal grasses. And, and where we have managed for carbon, the soil is actually cooler in the summer. So the idea here is to not have to adapt to the problem, but rather fix it and make this planet a really cool, lovely place again. And hopefully get the winter freezes back up and running to kill the beetles to save the forests. So my last question for you both is about soil microbes. And just like plants, vertebrates are slow to evolve and soil microbes are similarly slow to evolve. Scientists often presume that since soil microbes have a relatively simple genome, they would fare better in rapid climate shifts. There was a paper published in March of last year that looked at the possibilities of transplanting soil microbes to different elevations in the dryland ecosystems of eastern Washington. And the scientists, quote, resampled the original 1994 soil transplants and controls, measuring CO2 production, temperature response, enzyme activity, and bacterial community structure after 17 years, end quote. And the bottom line is that scientists found less adaptability than they expected, signaling that such geoengineering feats such as soil transplants will be problematic. So since soil microbes create the conditions that plants and trees need to grow, does this present a challenge for land restoration, assisted migration, or other last-ditch ways of aiding a landscape? And I know, John, you said that you weren't interested in the adaptation question, but if we were just to consider these other thoughts, um, what could you see as a solution? I'd like to address that. For me personally, it's an interesting frame of question. So they're looking at soil microbes um, that do a certain thing in one system and moving them up in elevation, anticipating that that in elevation will have a similar climate to what the microbes are used to, um, and not looking at the entire system, right? They've, you know, what plants are there? Uh, what minerals are in the soil? Uh, what's the history of that system? So I think that really the scientific paradigm today has by and large not yet delivered the type of thinking that's actually going to really solve this problem. What I love about very simple soil microbiological health is phrases like feed them and they will come, um, you know, give them homes and they will thrive. So when we talk about compost as being good for the soil, we're talking about the fact that it feeds the microbiological community, the fact that it creates 
housing or structure for the microbiological community to live in. The fact that it allows more air and more water to be in the soil, making that, that community even healthier. Um, and I think it's that type of thinking where you begin to look at the whole of the system and the synergistic functions within the system that's going to help us get out of this problem. I think that individualized solutions uh, that just take something like just temperature into account, but not the entirety of the system, or they want to replicate the system exactly somewhere else, are failing to acknowledge the reality that it's changing now, but that if you provide it with what it needs to be healthy, to, be, to thrive and be strong, that it can right itself. Now, I'm not saying that we know what that is under all conditions. We, we definitely don't. But what I am saying and what I think this body of science that comes out of the Marine Carbon Project and other similar projects is showing us is that by managing for carbon, we can begin to manage for the health and therefore the resilience and then the stability of those systems. So I, like John, am not interested in solutions that kind of look at a linear progression and not at the synergistic functions within our planetary system. I really loved how you answered that, Kala, because I think so much um, in science is extremely compartmentalized. We're taking these very focused approaches. We're missing so many points. Yeah, I would and suggest it's, it's that both the... more complex and more simple than we might think it is. You know, I think the beauty of the Marin Carbon Project in large part be became or was created because you had John and Peggy, who are very interested, dedicated uh, landowners, very smart, well-educated, and John, who's a builder, meeting with Dr. Jeffrey Creek, who's a rangeland ecologist, who has worked in biodynamic systems, who has always been outside and understood how to make the best compost and how to increase soil organic matter on organic farms, coming together with this biogeochemist very high level academic uh, scientist and saying and looking at it all together. And that it, it was really their three perspectives and the perspectives of the people around them, uh, like Nancy Scolari from the Resource Conservation District, who's you know, providing active technical assistance to farmers. It was those perspectives coming together and deciding which questions to ask that were important for all of those perspectives that were going to be interesting, that were going to be meaningful that yielded the type of science that they created and also yielded the type of strategies that they're now deploying um, to actually implement these solutions. So I, I really think that it's a combination of these types of thinkers coming together and asking these questions that really gets you to a point of something that's both real and meaningful from a scientific perspective, but also very actionable from a regular person or a policymaker's perspective. And I, I would suggest that this idea of transplanting a form of life into a foreign system, even though it may seem similar to where they came from, might be lacking community and functional guilds of things we don't even see or can't even measure. So for instance, there are viruses present in healthy soil, there are nematodes, there are fungi, there are bacteria, they all actually interact with each other. And they probably do it in pulses and in waves in response to environmental conditions that change day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And so for us, the exciting thing is to just simply manage for the environmental conditions that we think will favor a variety of life forms to express themselves. And what we witnessed was that a lot of good things happened, a cascade of good things happened that resulted in increased forage production, increased water holding capacity, increased diversity of organisms present in the system. And so managing the environmental conditions for good things to happen is our strategy. And looking at carbon as the lever that begins that process is, is what we've chosen to do. And 
Now we're exploring how that works across the entire state of California on 15 sites where we're controlling for the same compost and seeing how all of these different soil systems respond to that compost. And this time we are actually looking at the microbial communities and the nematode populations at depths down to a meter deep across the entire state of California in all of the major bioclimatic zones and major land resource areas. So our new insight that will come as a result of this project that was started last fall will be a deeper understanding of who's present in these systems during the phenomenon that we would consider to be healthy soils. And so when is a system healthy soil? What's the threshold and who's present and what are they doing during that moment when a system goes from depleted to healthy? And once we understand what that is, then we can experiment with, well, what other things can we do to promote good health? And what is good health and what can we do to promote good health across the soil systems of California to start with? Well, this is absolutely brilliant. You both are heroes to me, and I am so grateful for your dedication in looking so deeply and lovingly into these systems and finding these solutions. And I would just like to allow either of you to have any closing remarks you'd like to make and perhaps as well where we can find you, where we can learn more about the Marin Carbon Project and support both of your work. I'll take that first. Um, yeah, sure. I, I appreciate you so much for uh, interviewing us today and having us on your podcast. It was really a pleasure to speak with you, and I always enjoy um, learning from John. I, I usually hear something new that I haven't heard before. So I guess I'd like to close with two things in mind. One is that we're really asking the question about how nature would do it and what nature needs, and that doesn't mean creating hard technology in the form of nature. Uh, we're not talking about you know, building uh, plants that are going to sequester carbon. We're talking about supporting a technology that nature already has, which is photosynthesis, to increase carbon sequestration. So we're not talking about making technology that mimics nature. We're talking about supporting nature's own inherent technologies for healing and self-balancing and life. And I think that's really important to understand here. Um, and then secondly, I just want to acknowledge the fact that there are many traditional con cultures across the world that have in their, in their histories practiced some form of understanding of what it means to be in balance, um, to be reciprocal, to give back at the end of life, to create the beginning of life. And so we're not claiming discovery of that in any way, but what we are saying is that with the current scientific paradigm that leads us in our culture today, we have discovered and can point to research that shows that it's possible to stabilize the climate through soil carbon sequestration if we are an active and positive participant in that system. Well said. I like that. And so for me, in conclusion, I would like to share that we asked a question what can we do with the system we're managing, which was a grazed drains on system, and can we measure changes over time that suggest what we're doing is good? And, and we've determined that yes, we could actually increase durable soil carbon through management. And that was very exciting. The question to the audience is in your situa situation and in your systems, what can you do to start paying attention to your personal relationship to carbon and where you touch it in your lives. And one of the most interesting first places we could all look to is our clothing. And I strongly suggest everyone look at the fiber shed project and the um, information coming forward now about the textiles in our world and in our lives have actually become more and more and more plastic and derived from coal tar and different mined products. And the unfortunate fact is that when we're wearing these synthetic products like your um, yoga pants or performance sport wear, the recent analysis that was done showed that with your first washing in your conventional laundry, 250,000 particles of microfibers come off of the product. 
And every washing after that, more and more and more of those fibers come off of it. So from the very beginning, that product that we're now putting against our skin is becoming a source of microfiber pollution. And the analysis of ocean waters, 90% of the ocean's waters now contain a substantial amount of microfibers from our clothing. The unfortunate fact is that fish are now eating these fibers, knowingly or otherwise, and the food we are now eating contain microfibers from the clothing that we're wearing because of our laundry and, and the way that the fibers are assembled. So the idea that we could replace fossil fuel derived clothing and plastic clothing, which is what we're all wearing now, with naturally natural system derived fibers like hemp and wool and cotton and flax is very interesting to me. And the pigments used to color our fabrics are critically important to consider. The, blue that we enjoy is derived from coal tar and it takes a phenomenal amount of mined material to produce that blue color that we're putting against our skin that contains chromium and cadmium which are endocrine disruptors so as you disrupt your endocrines and go in life this will cause all kinds of health consequences there's another version of blue called indigo that's actually a plant so we could look to our fiber systems as a great entry point for everyone to consider how our personal lives are affected and can affect the systems upon which we rely. So my encouragement to people is to try and source clothing that's derived from soil that can be composted and go back to the soil without any plastics in it. And I would challenge people to look at the labels on their clothing, think about the country of origin, and try and solve for where their clothes come from, what they're made of, and are they compostable? And it's a great exercise. I myself am struggling with it. But fortunately, companies are coming out with hemp shirts and other, other products that we can enjoy wearing. So in conclusion, how are you touching carbon in your life? What are the carbohydrates you eat? What are the textiles you touch? And what are the different products like lumber, pigments, medicines, and things like that that you touch? Where are they coming from? How are they derived? And can we do better? And I believe we can. Well, thank you for that. My final, final, yes. final post <laughs> is just to say compost. It's really great. It's really easy. And just figure out how to do it. Um, once people get thinking about that, then they start to think about life in a whole new way. So um, I asked one thing, it would just be to think about, can you compost it? Where did it come from? And where is it going? Thank you both so much for diving into some intense and very, a lot of questions that took us deep into the vortex of climate change. So I truly appreciate your time with me today. And um, thank you again so much. Thank you. Oh, pleasure. Thank you for listening to For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. If you enjoy listening to this podcast, please consider supporting us at forthewild.world. We need your help to keep these projects rolling along. Our theme music is Silence Returns by Bo and Like a River from Kate Wolf. I'd like to thank our producer and editor, March Young, and our research director, Madison Mugolski.